so uh, today uh, we will now go ahead with the panel discussion. The panel discussion topic is how to promote uh, standards driven research. What is the incentive? We have a very good panel and uh, moderated by Professor Rajit Chaturvedi, uh, Director of IIT Roorkee. I mean, uh, the panelists are also very accomplished in their uh, fields and on uh, the top of uh, their organizations. Uh, we have Professor Bhaskar Ramamurthy, Director of IIT, uh, Professor Huzur Saran from IIT Delhi, Professor Kiran Kuchi from IIT Hyderabad, and Professor Neelesh Mehta from IIC Bangalore. Uh, I think Mr. Kishor Babu from DOT is not able to join because of some sudden meeting. Uh, uh, Professor, Chitra, uh, Professor Rajit Chaturvedi, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ganti. Uh, this wonderful opportunity for us uh, who have assembled in NCC uh, to discuss this important topic that uh, Professor Hari has raised, and that is uh, how to involve more and more academics in India into research that drives standards, uh, that can help in uh, bringing out the intellectual power of India in the formulation of standards and hopefully translate into economic gains, um, given the fact that it's a very important uh, commercial activity which uh, drives the industry. So this workshop already has provided a lot of background about standards. So maybe we don't need to spend too much time about uh, the importance of standards. Uh, I guess all of us who have assembled here, we, are, we do realize that standards are important to, to interface so that different devices can coexist so that we can get economies of scale so that it, uh, the fruits of the technology can reach to power corners to more and more people. All these things need standardization. And uh, if the standardization is done by players in which we don't have a role, naturally our interest will never be served. And the other way around, if we are capable of formulating standards, then why are we not present there? Our absence will be very conspicuous and it has not, not been very prominent, except in the last decade where we have started making a lot of efforts in this direction. And to talk more about this, I think this format is the right format to have a panel. Uh, so I'll straight away go into the panel. Uh, we'll basically have uh, two rounds of questions. And in the first round, uh, I'll float a question to each speaker and we'll expect the speaker to take three to four minutes to respond to that question. And then I'll go to the next speaker. And then after one, one cycle is complete, I'll come for the second round and again have a round of questions. So the questions may be slightly tailored to the speaker, to the panelist. So let me start with uh, Professor Nilesh Mehta and um, ask him this question uh, directly. Uh, should academics uh, be bothered about uh, what is happening in standards? Should academics participate in standardization activities? And if yes, then to what extent? Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, th thanks, Ajit. Um, so, so I'll give you an academician's perspective of um, standards-based research and, and also based on the experience we've had in IAC doing similar kind of work. Um, I think um, one of the most difficult problems for an academician is actually finding the research problem. Um, and I think uh, standards-based research gives is a very fertile ground for um, doing research, even for an academician. Of course, there's a perspective about how do you translate into so things that make a difference in the standard. But just standards-based research, uh, when you actually study the standard, um, you realize that uh, the, the way a standard is built is very different from um, the way you would probably normally analyze or you know um, optimize a digital communication system. There are issues related to, for example, robustness. There are issues related to control overheads. There are issues related to feedback overheads, which one normally doesn't realize uh, if you're a plain vanilla you know, digital communication engineer who studied courses. But when you study the standard and then you see, and these constraints can fund fundamentally alter the way you do research or create to fundamentally new problems, um, challenging ones. And of course, if you solve them, then these are very impactful and relevant and they're of interest to companies and standards. So, so in my perspective is, I think uh, it's a, instead of saying, you know, um, how can academicians uh, do this also? I think this is a very fertile ground for doing research in my view. Um, and a deep understanding of standards uh, is necessary. I mean, that's how the world works. 
yeah i'll keep quiet that. thanks uh, uh, nilesh could could you quickly give an example from your research which involves standards yeah so i can give you uh, two examples one was uh, way back when we were uh, so i let let me start with a more re more recent example so we've been doing a lot of work almost two three phd's two three masters have now spent time on this on what's called link quality metrics and these are essentially techniques that uh, help you figure out how to do link adaptation how to do feedback and anything built on that such as multi antenna schemes when you have a frequency selective channel and where does the standards come in if you actually study the 4g or 5g standards the standards basically mandate that you can't do water filling in any of the stuff we teach in uh, in a dc course uh you just have to send the same modulation encoding scheme over the entire bandwidth that you're given i mean it's 5 megahertz 10 megahertz 20 megahertz you've got to send the same modulation encoding scheme and uh, the question then arises how do you find that mcs how do you optimize it how do you do rate adaptation scheduling all of that and uh, this problem wouldn't have arisen if you've just taken a normal course so we've worked a lot on you know link quality metrics how do you analyze them and these are fairly non trivial problems the industry has a way of doing this in fact your base station does this every millisecond but to take a systematic analytical view to optimize it nobody does it they have their hacks uh, so this is one very nice example i can give you um, in fact we're still working on it and uh, it has applications for example we see now a lot of papers citing a work in b2x side link so this keeps going on and on uh, to give you another Maybe example um, yeah way back sorry go ahead i'll stop yeah yeah Should so I, I think what nilesh is saying is that because he involved standards he was able to solve more impactful problems more practical problems than his students would have otherwise solved i think that's what nilesh is saying uh, let's come to bhaskar uh, bhaskar uh, how can we motivate academics and especially india based academics that uh, they can spend their time because it at the surface it may appear that this is a wastage of time trying to read standards uh, understand standards how can we motivate our uh, colleagues faculty researchers academics to spend time in standardization activities and then drive the research through that thank you ajit uh, good morning uh, good afternoon to everybody so let me uh, start by saying that uh, you know i have been at this for 15 years now i was asked to set up a center by meti in 2005 to try and do this uh, standards based research and i didn't know how to do it and uh, you know it was look like uh, the, in fact initially i shied away from it then i was more or less arm twisted to doing it uh, it's been a good i mean a good arm twist because i think we've learned a lot so it is somewhat different so let me cut to the chase and just uh, just come to the crucial point because i've been an, i'm an academic i know what exactly concerns academics so you want to do research you want to do work you want to work on fairly you know uh, challenging new problems you want to have unfettered uh, you know uh, act, sort of view of the problem you don't want to be constrained too much by anything uh, you want good students you want the students want uh, you know good problems to work on so that they can uh, you know hopefully get good results and build a good career uh, you know launch their careers uh, research career as well and of course uh, you know you need the support you need funding and so on this is you want good papers to be published because that is the normal academic uh, measure of uh, whether you've got good ideas whether the community accepts your ideas and so on so this is what people are looking for now standards based research in wireless you know that by the way standards are there in everything including civil engineering and they go about it in a very different way at we don't have the time but one should actually at some point take a look at the whole picture but let's leave that for the time being in in uh, telecom in wireless communication everything is standards driven because if you a wants to talk to b unless you decide the protocol the language and so on you can't communicate so and standards every new generation standard wants to incorporate the latest ideas the best performance so that uh, you know they are competitive and they you get the best out of uh, the limited resources of spectrum energy all those things so naturally there's a huge scope there for new ideas to get it however it's a very this is a very constrained way of doing it as nilesh pointed out you have to you got to be you got to worry about not only things like uh, you know uh, which you normally ignore to a first to a very big first approximation when you do research a pure you know sort of very blue sky type of research you ignore the feedback constraints you ignore all those things so what you mentioned but you also ignore uh, you know backward compatibility issues you feel that oh you can start you know press the reset button in the world but that's not the way standards have to work standards have to worry about backward compatibility about how you introduce a new idea into the field with existing networks that are operating and so on so it's a it's a sort of a constrained research problem but yet 
you find that every new generation wireless standard in the last 30 years has introduced tremendous new ideas. So it's not that they have not done it. Therefore, it is certainly an area where academics can get it. Let me now cut to what is required. What are the changes required in thinking? And so one thing is, uh, you know, you need to, uh, standardization occurs at a frenetic pace. Every six to eight weeks, people meet. Only now it's happening virtually. And uh, for various reasons, it's likely to go back to face-to-face -face whenever they can do it. It's not likely to continue with in a virtual mode. Uh, so you have to be willing to, and you can't do this without going to those meetings. So whoever wants to participate, and work on ideas like Nilesh pointed out, very interesting ideas, but want to work on ideas that are potential ideas to get into a standard, you have to go to those meetings. And you have to sort of work on ideas which are being discussed. I mean, you can work on ideas that are likely to come up two years later at home, but finally you got to go there with your ideas and you got to go to all those meetings. So you got to be willing to travel six times a year, you or your team, some people are from your team. And over two year period, roughly, Every, every new study item gets finalized. So you have to sort of persist at this for two years. You could take a break after that and say, I'm not going to go, you know, I'm not going to participate in standardization for the next two years. That's fine. But if, when you start going, you've got to sort of go persistently for about two, two and a half years to, when you're working on a particular study, a study area. Um, you, you have to patent because any good ideas need to be patented. Now, Indian institutions have learned how to do this in the last few years. So that's not a new thing anymore. And, you know, just to give you data, yeah, since we started 15 years ago, we have filed numerous patents and now patents are getting granted. In last one or two years, patents are getting granted within a three-year period. So that's, I think, patents, uh, a PhD student working on something will definitely get the patents too. Not, It's not as fast as pa papers also take a year and a half nowadays to two years. This is a little bit longer, but it's not too much longer now. It used to be six, seven years, but that's changed. You can file international patents also, not too expensive compared to the kind of open access charges that some journals are charging, it's actually not much more. And uh, those uh, patents in the US, for example, definitely get granted mostly within three years. So that's, uh, and once you file the patent, once you file a PCT, you know, you can actually publish also. Your idea is protected. So there's nothing stopping somebody from publishing a paper, which, may, which is based on the same idea, but maybe packaged differently, a lot more simulation results, maybe a lot more, a lot less constraints imposed on the, on the model and so on. Bhaskar, so you can, can do... I ask a pointed question? Yeah. yeah. See, how do you create an ecosystem in India in which academics who spend time on standardization, their yeah. effort and work is recognized by their yeah. peers? So that's what I'm coming to this. So what the, so TSDSI was very important for that. So now TSDSI is the forum. So not only you, are, you can go to the international standards bodies, you can also participate in TSDSI, which of course can happen virtually and locally and so on. So, and we have formed a fairly large team now. So there is a, it's, you're not working like, you know, alone somewhere now. There's a huge team. And in fact, now finally, you know, though it, uh, we started this effort 15 years ago at the instance of the government, finally it has, it has sunk into government at many levels that this is something that has support very strongly. And just last week, uh, you know, we proposed an expansion to eight institutions uh, from earlier it was being done by two, three institutions. Just last week, a project involving eight institutions has been approved with a three year funding so that you can see it through on full phase. Right. So, we, and you know, I'm sure it will grow beyond this. So I think uh, with the, uh, with the fairly generous funding that now uh, government is, uh, is recognizably giving for this with TSDSI in place, I think all the, all the uh, required uh, uh, eco ecosystem is in place. As I said, you have to put together a team of PhD students, probably some MTech students after their degree, you know, are looking for more exciting work than just some routine testing or their product development. For a few years at least, you can get them into the project. So teams anchored by faculty below, you know, with some PhD students or postdocs, with some MTech students below them. Uh, I think on each problem, you need a team of about four or five. Some of them will have to keep going to these meetings. It will be a great experience for the PhD student and the MTech student. So I think they will love it. Uh, if once you do it for two, three years, actually, it gets very tiring, but for youngsters, it's not a problem. And then you can, as I said, you can take your ideas to the standard. You can try to get them to the standard. You can patent things and you can publish. So you can do all of this. So I don't see this as in any way coming in conflict with what a normal academician does with once this entire paraphernalia, the ecosystem has been put in place. Yes, it was much harder 15 years ago, 10 years ago when I, when I started this, but now the thing is in place and we, in fact, we've expanded it to eight institutions now involving a lot of youngsters in many uh, institutions and we can expand beyond that as more and more get in. 
And because the the high level forum which looked uh, for, which was created for 5G uh, at the time 5G was coming in by DOT, the task force and standardization has explicitly recommended that the scale of the effort must be increased several times over. And partly the image the, the current effort that I just mentioned, which has been approved last week, is the first step in that. So, therefore, the short answer to your question is: I think academicians will find it much easier to do this. They must be assured that yes, this does not come into conflict with their academic sort of. Uh, requirements or what they are required to do as research. It is a. I, I think that I, what Nilesh said is absolutely right. Very soon you realize you get you start working on really nice problems. Though it does appear initially that you are working in too much of a constrained situation, and you know you don't have the full freedom, unfettered way of doing research. That you, therefore your the problems you are working on are becoming highly constrained. It appears like that, but that's not true. And I want to give cite the example. In you know in different countries things work differently. In the U.S. a lot of the Research uh, in uh, for standards is done in companies. In Europe, actually, it's done in companies, but also in universities. One good example for you to look at would be the Dresden uh, team, uh, Fetwise's team in Dresden. They do a lot of standards-based research, and they've been doing it for you know twenty years yeah. now. And in China, China, the universities and the uh, Beijing Post and Telegraph all and all very tightly coupled. So I'll come back to this point. Uh, I'll come back to this point in the next next round. I'm tempted to go to uh, Kiran, but uh, because I don't want to take three physical layer people background in sequence. So maybe first I'll go to Huzur Saran and uh, I'll take his view and then uh, we have to hear Kiran because he has done a lot of work in this area. So, uh, Professor Huzur Saran, uh, can you tell us from your own personal experience how you have evolved, how your view has evolved in terms of standardization and the need for academics to get involved in standardization activities through their research? So, uh, thanks. So, uh, as far as standardization goes, I think as was pointed out, it does require an intensive engagement. See, that is one big challenge. See, sometimes uh, you, uh, like uh, for edge computing and those kinds of activities, I actually tried to attend a few of the sessions, but it was really impossible for me alone to keep attending sessions for two years, right? And only after you attend three, four sessions, you really start understanding what are the exact problems one could work on, right? So, so that's one part of it. And that's where I think, like Bhaskar said, he had, uh, as he said, fortunately got arm twisted into setting up uh, CWIT. And then the CWIT, he had a pool of small pool, five, 10, uh, uh, member team in the beginning of talented researchers who were supporting him. So it was not that just Bhaskar was going every time, right? But it was, uh, and the team was spending time engaging, understanding the standard. So the point is, it's very hard to engage alone. That's what I'm trying to say. And then, of course, now we have been doing work on MEC. Actually, what I, since in IIT Delhi, there was nobody else who was very keen on MEC at that time. Bask, uh, the British had some interest, and then Arzad Kirani from IIT Bilai had an interest. So we virtually joined together. And in fact, uh, Bhaskar was kind enough to allow us from our funds in IIT Delhi to in, uh, involve uh, Arzad and get him also to work with us on some of these topics. And so the first thing is you do need a critical mass of people if you're going to engage in any study, right? And that's one lesson. Right, and that is where, uh, if you look at expanding beyond the first few institutions, if you want all the NIT, some researcher working at an NIT who's a bright chap, you want him to be participating. He's not going to find a team locally, right? So maybe TSDSCI can also facilitate that in some way, right? Uh, to scale it out. That's what I'm saying. One is. And you see, even if you look at the problem, there are some people who are continuously attending these meetings. And some from the, from the way, time you spend attending the meeting, you can figure out what are the interesting problems to work on. And maybe you can feed that to the academic people. So if you had a pool of engineers who were smart people who are attending these meetings, who had interest in this, and also worked with academics, that could be another way. For example, in MEC, we also found that you know, standards by their nature, one standard group will focus on only a certain narrow specification. For example, in 3GPP, there I attended SA6 group, 
which was the looking at some of the edge computing things. Then HC has its own edge computing standardization. So you have to look at multiple of them and still some things slip over. See, for example, in edge computing, as you know, in the end for edge computing to work, a developer has to be able to use edge computing. So you need developer tools also. How do you design compilers to you leverage edge computing? So there are very interesting problems that you find once you start engaging. If you just think of your edge computing and the abstract people come up with all sorts of proposals. But when you say how it will work with the HC standards and what SS6 is doing, what the security aspects are being addressed, then it becomes a much more interesting solution that you can work out. So definitely, I think uh, the point that Nilesh made that once you start engaging with standardization, you can get very interesting problems. In the beginning, the um, hesitation of the researcher is, academicians especially is, that if I end up spending a year getting engaged with this and I don't even find an interesting problem in a year, anyway, I can take some abstract problems, purely academic problems and get a couple of papers out and that will help me with my, whatever my career goals are, right? So we need to somehow yeah, that's an important point. Yeah, yeah. Maybe feed them some interesting problems, find out who are the people who really find some of this stuff interesting and get them engaged. Fine, that is fine. would help a lot. I think that's a very impo important point. All the three panelists have spoken that uh, if you spend some initial time trying to invest in understanding standards and the standardization process, it can be equally rewarding in terms of the quality of research that you do. In fact, it can be more rewarding because you may end up getting more interesting problems or rather more impactful problems to solve. Well, we are missing Mr. Kishore Babu. He would have provided a government perspective, a very important panelist, but unfortunately, due to a last minute engagement, he is unable to join. So now we go to Kiran, Kiran Kuchi, who has done extensive work in standardization, very good experience, a lot of experience in physical activity and beyond. And I think I we would like to hear Kiran's experience and how his perspective has evolved over the last decade. Kiran. Oh, sir, thank you. Uh, I want to share a few things. Uh, I have been working on standards on and off. Uh, my first job was at Motorola Labs Fort Worth. I was just out of grad school with masters. Uh, they asked me to develop something called transmit diversity. The notion of space-time codes was not the coin then. So we uh, so I worked with some people and introduced uh, a transmit diversity scheme in a CDMA 2000 standard in around 1998 time. Then uh, they gave me a paper published by AT&T Labs and they showed me this Alamotis uh, space-time block code. Then I quickly came up with a method uh, how to extend it to four antennas and we submitted it to 3G standard. And later on, it actually became part of LTE also. Today it's used in the phones. And they also taught me how to file a patent. I sat with the attorney for three days and he drafted the claims. That was quite a revealing experience. So, and then I, you know, I joined CVIT uh, subsequently and we did WiMAX. Then I became a faculty and I, for four or five years, I didn't uh, do anything but teaching and uh, writing papers. Uh, when TSDSA was formed, again, uh, it got my interest renewed. I started attending 3GPP meetings. Uh, so what I, the first thing I did was, you know, uh, I had this idea that, uh, you know, the, the waveforms in, uh, you know, in, in 4G was uh, highly power inefficient. I was thinking of how to make this, uh, you know, make it a GSM-like signal. You know, GSM always was transmitting at full power. WFDM had lots of inefficiencies. So there were some ideas, but they evolved over long periods of time. When I first proposed it, I proposed it for narrowband IoT, uh, which is an OS standard in the very beginning. And they refused it and uh, for various reasons. And I had to wait patiently for a year or two and then sub, you know, submit it to 5G new radio. You have to really work at it for a long periods of time. Finally, they've opened up to the idea, but then other companies, I don't know if many academicians know, uh, many companies proposed release codes to reduce PIPR. And there are lots of kinds of schemes that they proposed. And finally, they couldn't match up to this particular scheme, uh, fiber to BPSK, this with one plus D pre-coding. It's kind of like a trellis code. It's like a two-tap trellis. And it gained traction. And uh, I only did through simulations. Then Qualcomm uh, measured and showed that actually you can uh, transmit the signal at, uh, at the PA saturation using the actual 5G PF form. That's when other companies uh, took interest. Then I had three PhDs who did their PhD on this. And one thing led to another, it was a, we hit upon a you know, gold mine of problems, one after the other, lots of new methods we developed. And it was almost like a three, four year effort. 
um and uh, now i i don't tell my students uh, what to work on they work with me for a few years and then they they work on these standards and they find lots of problem to solve so i don't see this as a very big problem but it's a different kind of research you know it, it is good it, you can do good quality work i mean i'm talking about you know transmit diversity scheme space time codes you know designing constant envelope waveforms they they have a significant uh, impact in the long run right so uh, what i want to say is that uh, you have to have interest the faculty and the commitment required is very very high you know you have to work on this for a year a couple of years something may not happen like professor zuri is saying then you take a back seat and then you, you you have to keep at it and one one important thing i i i think i feel is that it's just not one faculty you have to have a team of people and an organization like cvet it was kind of anchoring these things you know i was part of the organization but i think other iit should also think about having an organization like cvet who will you know do the front work you know front ending if i am qualcomm ericsson or somebody else i wouldn't necessarily like a bunch of faculty coming in and throwing ideas at them from university cgpp doesn't work that way you need yet another organization who is kind of doing fronting and then the faculty can revolve around it they can come and go i think that kind of model needs to be evolved i think that's something we need to look at it seriously and iit's director should allow people to travel which is not the rules doesn't permit this kind of work as of today you know you you are a director basket is a director i don't know how i managed it my director allowed it but as far as institute rules are concerned standards based research traveling this you know go back and forth you know teaching commitments you need to give us some break so if you can tweak these rules i think we can do a lot of good work in the future thank you thank you kiran the, wonderful to hear all that experience i think now let me go to the second cycle of this uh, uh, question answer and here i would like the panelists to uh, sort of respond to what they've heard from the others and also include in their uh, thought process as to what we can learn from the international experience especially like china or europe and in what way we are different in what way we can leverage that Uh, where if we copy we will fail where we have to be different that kind of perspective uh, will be very useful and maybe let me start with bhaskar in this yeah so you know i think uh, this is an evolutionary process i think we are going to get to a stage uh, it has taken longer than it should have but finally it's happening now where companies will be there which will actually be very active in this because in telecom no company can become big without substantial presence in the standards and their own ip also in the game okay there is no company that just makes things and becomes big you know to take any company even the new companies that have become big like huawei and others have samsung and all have ip okay it's not only the ericsson and nokia who have been around for 30 40 50 years of uh, qualcomm so indian companies will are also getting there and i think in the last 2 years i'm seeing substantial movement all these things have to fight to fall in place tsdsi various things i mean i don't want to get into that we are still not out of the woods but i think i am seeing it happen in fact so the end point ultimately as kiran said will be these companies will be active and these companies in india for some time will need to depend on partnerships with, the, with academia to really provide the meat on the table it's going to take lot more time before companies have the kind of rnd teams that uh, other you know their comp their uh, peers across the world have I many like if you go to ericsson and others you see old companies they have like a within the organization they have an almost semi i mean you know, almost academic team also working these companies are going to take some time and there's really no need one could think of uh, one doesn't have to copy them in every way they evolved in their own period we could have a permanent model where there is a nice coupling between academic institutions and these com uh, these companies so the, what we did what when civit started this even the simulator was not available we wrote our own i think now we are sharing it with everybody so if you know don't have, everybody has not doesn't have to follow that path some things don't have to be repeated you know so my feeling is going forward academic institutions will have to prop the companies in india are still not yet there they have to grow to that size they have to come up but uh, tsj sai is also help, giving a helping hand in that even to the startup so when that happens in a few years i think the what kiran said which is ultimately in 3gpp and other standards bodies they expect such companies to be the face right but they are quite used to academics working with them i mean that is happening as i told you in other countries so that is the stage we'll get to but till that time like in startup you know whatever is if you have to sweep the floor you have to sweep the floor you can't wait for somebody to come and sweep the floor so till that time we have to do whatever it takes so we have to go we have to form this uh, you know uh, 
and that's why civit has been now civit is almost now uh, fronting for these eight institutes okay so that's how is the next phase we are doing so that but all that is temporary that's not going to be the permanent permanent model there could easily be one or two more civits there's nothing wrong in that but i don't think that's necessarily the permanent model the permanent model is in a few years i think there will be companies in india which will which will tie up with academic institutions and and uh, provide the you know that's what will happen yeah huzur saran i had a question uh, do you think that this standardization business uh, is in some way in contradiction or conflict with our general philosophy in academics that we need to be very open about ideas freely talking coffee sipping and really sharing whatever new you are doing or we have to be slightly more sort of uh, in terms of secretive or uh, is there a dichotomy there well uh, so uh, the point uh, uh, there is a certain amount of uh, tension as you say tension is as as kiran pointed out even in the conflict in terms of schedules if as a academician you are going to be spending a lot of time on the actual standard making effort and you are required to attend every meeting which is four to six weeks and then every, that means every four or five weeks you are going to travel for a week that will definitely disrupt the academic schedule and then you have to work with your institution for that plus generally speaking if you go to a selection committee see you of course know the typical evaluation metric if somebody says i got a standard through whether it will be actually counted or not depends a lot on how the director feels and how the committee members feel there is no uh, formal way like if somebody says no you did this standard we don't consider it right there is nothing you can protest about it so as a researcher if i say i got four journal papers in top journal i know nobody is going to deny me my promotion right or whatever number i'm just illustrating but if i got a very nice standard as kiran got one done how, where does it count how much does it count yes i got research project that maybe counts a little bit right i got some crore of funding but even that is anyway you should have something typically not you don't have to have a lot right so the point is as if i am a young uh, budding researcher and i am worried about my promotions and i am worried that my director may not like me taking too much leave and if the head of the institution himself has no particular desire for standardization right then the support may not be there so that's where the yeah, institutional we, structure we are running out of time so are maybe we articulate huh Yeah, yeah, we are we are running short of time, so let me. Uh, sorry, sorry. If you can conclude, yeah. yeah, I think that's conclude. the point I wanted to make. Fine, fine. Kiran, uh, sorry, Nilesh, Nilesh, I had a very pointed question for you specifically. Do you think that when you took up a job as an academic during the course of your journey, you, your view towards standardization has changed? Mm. Mm. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's a difficult question. Uh, I'll put it this way, and I'll keep it brief. Um, I think uh, I took the easy path or the lazy path, and um, which is the following. I think one of the things Bhaskar mentioned, Kiran mentioned. I think it's absolutely true. Is the extent of travel, and it's not just the travel. There's a meeting. There are three hundred contributions. So even in your area, there's a lot of pre-meeting discussions. post meeting discussion so there is a very very serious time commitment and um, as an academician it's extremely challenging at least or rather well you have many other options too um so uh, the view towards standardization has changed in the sense that um, i love the new problems that i can get but it's very very challenging to combine your you know your research agenda with a go at it type attack in which you would do in a company because you'd lose your job anyway otherwise so uh mixing the two is very challenging and uh, i think um some structure that helps do that um, would be fantastic so yes the view has changed as an academician because you have so many other avenues you know uh, you can chat with students you can chat with faculty you can just explore problems in addition to doing standards research and not just that uh, but um if you are going into it full time and also i would like to point one thing out um when i went to standards i mean it's been more than 14 years now since I attended the standards meeting but there i could see people 
like you know from Ericsson Eric Dalman or people from Norton which is bankrupt now but people from TI who are all now in Huawei they've been at it since release 6 release 7 some are for GSM era folks who carried through the standard now then release and there are some people i see now from Samsung and Huawei who have been there even until release 15 so you're looking at people fine, who are fine, fine delay, you can about con- the standard you can conclude yeah. thanks yeah, yeah, yeah kiran Uh, uh kiran uh, the question that i asked huzur saran regarding this uh, dichotomy do you have a view on that uh, can you be as open as you are in in terms of academic ideas research or you have to be more like company oriented when you talk of standardization you have to unmute unmute sorry i just press the wrong button okay so uh you need to tread carefully when you develop uh, especially when you're on to something very important uh, i have made a mistake and let the hard way i'll give you this example uh, when i started contributing to 5g new radio uh, i had a uh, i had written up this waveform uh, it has all kinds of different possibilities i spent 3 months on it filed a patent and then i took the whole description to 3gpp okay first of all you never show all your cards at once okay that's the rule number 1 in 3gpp you show a little bit little bit over time and in fact uh, only on the last day when the moment of truth comes out everybody reveals their card this is the way it works i didn't quite know that uh, although i was exposed to the process a little bit but it was still new to me so that's one mistake we did so essentially when you show all your cards it works against you when you publish i had published some of the ideas thinking that i filed a patent it worked against me then when i got the traction i got too excited and talked to talk to press about it that worked it hurt me a lot more <laughs> uh, because those who didn't know about this they said their life's mission is to pre- make sure that this never happens in reality they told me people told me so uh, you have to tread very carefully when you are especially on to a very good idea you don't want to talk too much about it then we have this uh, funding agencies they keep asking you reports and descriptions which is sort of open so sometimes you don't want to tell people what you are going to do in the next 6 months so there is a lot of tension if you really are serious about it yeah that's that's very very uh, enlightening bhaskar any last word we are going to conclude now yeah i think uh, what has been pointed out is right uh, it is not it is certainly less less is fair than acad- the kind of academic research we are used to no doubt about it and therefore any faculty member who launches on this for the good reasons that people have pointed out nilesh has pointed out i have pointed out kiran pointed out is also accepting a lot of pain a lot of additional pain i think what huzur saran pointed out is absolutely right institutions must back this so there is a certain amount of uh, if you want to use a very simple word education that's required at the in leadership level to understand what this is about why this is how it is valuable if it's done right and how to assess whether it's been run done right or not because that's really ultimately the basis for promotions and other things and uh, it's not that difficult there are objective measures as i said patents can be there uh, you know contributions to standard accepted all these are uh, can be but this should be understood i mean we have a problem what huzur pointed out is there even for very good industrial work i mean you do something with industry and maybe the committee won't understand okay you can't measure it purely by the amount of money involved so those issues remain there's no doubt about it but i would still think that uh, you know as especially for uh, academics who are in india's leading in national institutes of national importance public institutions particularly we have a role bigger than just you know just looking after our own interest as an academic i mean we have a role bigger i think we must be willing to uh, to uh, take this additional pain however i agree that the institutions have to also back this you can't do this with the institution also coming in your way i mean this leave problem etc should not i mean so i think it's partly behoving on all of us who understand it to make sure that the, this becomes widespread and the right kind of work high quality work is supported and encouraged and rewarded that's our job thank you thank you thank you i think it's a very uh, very useful discussion uh, view points uh, are more or less aligned although different view points came but they are all aligned in the same direction that it is very much possible it is very much possible to get peer recognition it is very much possible to get the satisfaction that you're looking for and at the same time it will give you uh, access to interesting problems and probably also contribute to the economy of the country and more importantly the soft power of the country in terms of making its visibility across the globe so thank you uh, bhaskar thank you huzur saran thank you kiran thank you nilesh uh, for for participating in this discussion and i hand it over back to the organizers thank you thank you thank you very much thank you sir
Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi, and uh, all the panelists. It was a wonderful uh, discussion.